ago, we had established a group of people called the Dream Team who shared some really wonderful ideas with us. And one of those ideas was the holy hush, the idea of being able to center ourselves before worship. And the one thing about tradition, or the one thing about introducing new ideas, is that sometimes we need to remind ourselves why we do that and why it exists. So what I would like to ask Lisa, if you could please stand and ring the bell three times, and we're going to allow ourselves a moment of entering into that holy hush.
with the spirit of the Holy Hush. Let us once again say, Welcome to Emmanuel, where we have a passion for God and, and compassion for all. And I don't know about you, but sometimes just having that moment of silence, it really just creates that space for the Holy Spirit to enter on in. We'd like to say welcome to everyone who is here today. It is good to see returning faces. And it is also a bit bittersweet to see faces of those who are leaving this week so they can resume their life up north amongst their family and friends. We'd like to say happy birthday this week to Larry Conrad, who turns 80 and is treating himself to a well-deserved cruise. We'd like to say happy birthday to Angelo and to Randy O'Dell. We share the really good news from Reverend John Piper that this week the doctors told him that as of today he is cancer free and he is just so excited about that we want to lift up the fact that tomorrow we have such an awesome opportunity we have been invited by the garden club of sebring to do a presentation on the garden of hope and not only will we be there presenting, but also the members of ARC will be there as well. Ruthie has created an amazing PowerPoint. She's gonna be there with me as well. So the office will be closed until about one, but please know that's because Ruthie and myself and other people will be doing this presentation about our garden. Wednesday is the council meeting at nine o'clock. And as you can imagine, there will be a lot to discuss at that meeting. The meeting is open for anyone who wishes to attend. Again, it's Wednesday at 9 in our council room. Sunday, I'll be on vacation, but Reverend Larry Moore will be preaching. If you've ever heard him, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal preacher. And after worship today, not only do we have a special treat that Sherry has made for us, but we're also going to be blessing a prayer shawl. This is for Jim's daughter, Tara, who unfortunately has received a diagnosis of cancer. And we want to be able to show Jim and Tara and his family our support. So if you've never been present to bless a prayer shawl, it's rather simple. We gather around a prayer shawl that has been lovingly made by Nadine. We anoint it with oil that has beautiful fragrance. We say the Lord's Prayer, and then we each have an opportunity to hug that prayer shawl, so that way our love and the gifts of the Spirit can be embedded within that. Yes? Could I just add to your announcement for the council? It is coming up this Wednesday, and as he said, there's gonna be a lot to do. One of the things that we have to do as council is appoint a search committee. And so I don't want this to be a council committee. Yes. I want it to be a congregational committee. So if anybody has any interest, please let us know if there's any interest in serving on this search committee, uh, because we will be addressing that. Uh, we'll be finalizing it or not, but we will be addressing it. But I really want to see members of the congregation be part of that rather than council. With that being shared, you are invited to silence your cell phones if you feel comfortable enough to do so. And all the stress and all the worries from the week before, now is the time to set that aside. And as our musicians usher us into a holy space and a holy time, let us join together as we sing our mission theme song. <laughs>
applause for the call to worship. We proclaim Jesus, the Messiah. In Christ we find love and universe. The good news has a way of changing the world. With Christ as our King, all things are possible. Welcome to all who believe, and welcome to all who wonder. Together we are learning just what it means to be the people of the resurrection. Please join us now in our musical blessing, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing.
I don't know about you, but today was perfect sleeping weather. And so it is a joy that we're here knowing that we could all still be in our bed fast asleep. <laughs> but because of that, and because we know we are here to share and celebrate the good news, let us turn to one another and safely extend the sign of welcome and grace. <laughs> And knowing that we have people worshiping with us from all over, let us turn to the camera in the back and extend to them also a sign of welcome and a sign of grace. Amen. You may face forward. Christ is our advocate, leading us to the light of righteousness, which means no matter what tragic mistakes we may have made, we can always take them before Jesus and lay them at his feet. Let us now enter into our own time of silent confession. knowing that the God who loves us is also the God who forgives, let us join together and say, The Lord listens to our hearts, forgives our sins, and shines upon us. We are surrounded by grace and not forgotten. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, verses 1 to 9. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of Jews. And Paul went in, as was the custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar while they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked 
Jason's house. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city authorities, shouting, these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They are all <coughs> acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this, and after they had taken Baal from Jason and the others, they let them go. Here ends the reading. The song that we're going to see now is Song of Hope, Canto de Esperanza. It's one of my favorite in English and Spanish because they're talking about something that we really need in this world now. So I encourage you to sing in the English part and please join us in the Spanish part too. We're going to go together. Canto de Esperanza, Daos Gozo y Paz. Al mundo en crisis, habla de tu amor. Dios de la justicia, mándanos tu luz, luz y esperanza en la oscuridad. Voy a decir en inglés, everybody, please. sing the first time we did this and I heard them now and I am literally hearing that you are practiced, you have rehearsed, you are familiar with what you're saying. Kid, you sound wonderful. Yeah. I can hear you. Amen, amen, amen. And we have an amazing teachable moment. Rhoda just read us the scripture and you know how words matter and that there is a way to manipulate words if you kind of want to hide a little bit of truth that you don't really want people to hear. Did you notice how it said that there were Greeks who were turning to the gospel? And then it says, and not a few of the leading women. What that expression, not a few of the leading women, actually means is that there were many, 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 many women, but the author doesn't want to tell you that. So the author uses the word not a few to make you think, okay, maybe one or two. No. If you want to know why the gospel of Jesus Christ was so threatening, part of it is how many women were turning to the gospel 
and were finding a place of privilege and presence in a community and at a time that was seen as very threatening. And I also hope you heard the word king being used because we are to never forget that a large part of our faith is something that makes a political difference and a political statement, even if we don't realize it. Passing out food on Monday at the Shepherd's Pantry is a political statement in which you are saying everyone deserves to be fed. And that is a radical, radical thing to say. So with all of that being shared, let us now turn to a moment of centering prayer. Gracious and Holy One, we thank you for your gifts. We thank you for your abiding love, which brings us closer to you, the source of all our blessings. And we give thanks that we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ as one body. It is in your Son's name we pray and we say, Amen. Amen. Hear these words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Love is patient, and love is kind. Love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Can we get an amen? amen? Love never ends. Now these are the words of the Apostle Paul, and these are words that he wrote to a church in Corinth. And many people, when they come across this passage, they make the assumption that Paul is talking about romantic love. So oftentimes you'll hear the scripture read at weddings or you'll find it on Hallmark cards. And that's actually a very understandable mistake. But the love that Paul is actually talking about, the love that Paul is addressing in his letter to the Corinthian church, is the kind of love that exists within a church. It's the kind of love that exists amongst the believers and followers of Jesus Christ. When Paul states in his letter to the Corinthian church that love is patient, he means that the members of the congregation should be patient with one another. When Paul states that love is not envious and love is not boastful, he means that as siblings in Jesus Christ, we are not to flaunt our faith or our blessings in such a way that we can unintentionally harm someone else. When he says that love is to rejoice in the truth, what he means is that as citizens of God's heavenly kingdom, we should be filled with joy that is based upon the good news. As believers who are brought together by the resurrection, it makes sense that faith-based love never ends. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that Christ's place in the world has no end. And if you recall in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells us very plainly what the greatest commandments are. Jesus says the greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. So as long as we love, as long as we love God, as long as we love our neighbor, there is no end. There's new beginnings, there's new chapters, there's new errors, there's new journeys to behold. You see, moments may come to an end, errors may have an end, but love, love that is rooted in the resurrection and the good news of Jesus Christ never comes to an end. So, it is so heartbreaking 
when we encounter a scripture like today and a story in which we get to witness what exactly does the absence of love look like. Now the apostles, they are no longer waiting patiently in Jerusalem. The apostles have branched out all over the world. The apostles are sharing with all they know the good news about Jesus Christ. And Paul and Silas, well, they have headed into the Wild West. They have headed into a land in which there are so many different faiths. They are in a place in which people are worshiping so many different Greek gods and goddesses, but they're also in a place in which people literally believe that the emperor or the king or the ruler is an embodiment of God. And if they don't believe this, well, they're pretty much forced to say that they believe this. Paul and Silas are out amongst the people who have the kind of faith in which what they believe is tied up in politics. And they are around people in which their politics are crammed into what they believe. This is a time in which the politicians are tied into the people's faith. So for Paul and Silas to speak out, for them to share the knowledge of Jesus, for them to call the Messiah the King, that is so controversial for where they are. And the more they talk about the kingdom of God, the more they refer to Jesus as the Messiah, the more they refer to him as the king, Paul and Silas are becoming a national threat. They are in a place and in a time in which those in power have let it be known if you preach or if you teach about anything that doesn't fill our agenda or elevate us or fit into what we believe, then you are going to have to pay the cost. But what's amazing is even with this reality, even with these threats, Paul and Silas are not scared away. And it's because they are filled with that love. Love for God, love for their neighbor, love for the good news of Jesus Christ. So in today's story, we learn about how they talk so persuasively and so passionately that some of the Greek nationalists are starting to follow them, as do a bunch of women who have power back in their day. I mean, think of the good news of Jesus Christ being so powerful that some of the most popular women in their community are starting to believe. And there is no doubt, there is no doubt at all that when these Madonnas and Beyonce's and Meryl Streep's get to be part of this community, they also get to have more of a prominent role and a more larger presence. And imagine how that becomes even more of a threat to the powers that be. So what happens? The people in power, the ones who feel that they must absolutely have control, those that feel threatened by this message of love, they act in a way that is so completely unloving. They do not rejoice. What they do is they become envious. They do not act kind, but they become irritable, resentful, and so what they do is they hunt down Paul and Silas, and they engage in such blatant wrongdoing as they storm into Jason's house, and they drag Jason out simply because he offered a place for Paul and Silas to stay. They are so threatened by the good news of Jesus Christ that they need to hurt somebody, anybody, to alleviate all that envy and arrogance that they are feeling. The commandments of Jesus is to love God and to love neighbor. And those commandments are so strong and seen as such a threat that even after Christ has been crucified and resurrected and ascended, 
the people with the power in the world feel the need to crucify him again and again and again and again. It is absolutely a wonder. It is absolutely amazing that Christianity has survived as long as it has. It is a wonder that the good news has ever made it through. It is absolutely amazing that 2,000 years later, we are gathered here today because back then the leaders and the kings and the politicians of the world tried over and over and over again to silence us and shame us and to shut the gospel down. But, but as Paul says, love never ends. The love that Jesus talked about never ends. The love that Jesus demonstrated never ends. The love that Jesus embodied when he reached out to a mother or lifted up a sister or ate with someone who was differently different, that's the kind of love that never ends. The kind of love that Jesus demonstrated every time he spoke to someone in a field or by the shore or in a graveyard, that's the kind of love that cannot end. It is the kind of love that cannot be silenced or shamed or shut down. That is the kind of love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and that is the kind of love that endures all things, no matter what you or no matter what a congregation may face. The love that Jesus showed, the love that Christ calls us to have for God and to have for our neighbor, that is the kind of love that has no end. Because that is kingdom love. That is heaven love. And that is endless love. And for that, let us say, Amen. Amen. Let us now enter into our own moments of personal reflection. Holy and gathering one, we give thanks for your gifts of love, and we come before you today asking that you surround Jim's daughter Tara with your love. We lift up Darlene as she prepares to move back north. Lord, we are mindful of the events that have been taking place around us. It seems that automobile accidents have increased. We are mindful of the shooting that took place in Sebring and in New York and Tennessee. We are especially mindful of the news that pregnant women around our country are now being turned away from the ER during times of crisis. And Holy One, we are mindful of the events that have taken place in Sydney. But Holy One, we also come before you with love and thanksgiving for all the ways in which your message is continuing to make itself known. We lift up Chris, who will soon have an opportunity to meet with the Committee on Ministry as he seeks his own calling. We lift up the day of caring that took place throughout our county for Reverend Kuiper and his good news for the painting that took place in the sanctuary this week. We give thanks for the ministry of the pantry and the movie night, and we lift up our council and for the nominations and the people who will be part of the search committee. But Holy One, most especially today, may you remind us that the love we find in you and the love that has united us as one 
is a love that continues no matter where, no matter when, and no matter what may transpire. It is in your son's sacred name that we pray and we say.
thank you for that beautiful song of hope. I came here not that long ago on New Year's Day in 2023, and I had hope, hope to find a church that spoke to me, that was what I needed, and what I believed inside. And from the very beginning, from the music of these two beautiful people in the choir, I was swept up. Then the message from Pastor George, and it was like, I had something to care about, to think about, and it spoke to me. I thought, you know, it's my first church that I stepped out and tried, and I think I'm staying right here. <laughs> and I'm just so grateful, grateful for all the people I keep meeting, and we need to open our hearts now to say thank you to the church and support it. Amen. And whether you've been here like some from the very beginning, or it's been five years or 10 years, or maybe you visited twice, we need to appreciate what we have here and try and support it in every way that we can. Would the ushers please come forward? Count your blessing till we can count. So let's sing all together. Count your blessing.
there's something you may or may not know about worship at Emmanuel. Ari and Cardine never know what the topic of my sermon is. And I never know what songs they've selected or what songs the choir are going to sing. Because the Holy Spirit just moves amongst all of us. Amen. Today's sermon was not Corinthians. It was not about love. And yet every song you selected had the word love in it. That is clearly the Holy Spirit. Today's scripture was about a man being dragged out of his house. But for some reason the Holy Spirit said you need to preach about love from Corinthians. And the music validated that message. So I want to say thank you. The other thing is that Ari and Carney just blessed me and all of us with a gift. The song they played is called There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit in This Place by a woman named Doris Akers, who I personally knew. And when she died, she left all of her copyrights to a mission in Haiti. Amen. So anytime any of her music is performed, there are children who are receiving funds so they can be fed, yeah. so they can be educated, and so they can receive proper medical care. Yeah. So thank you for sharing Doris Akers with us today. Our closing announcements is a reminder that we have our council meeting to a Wednesday at 9. Today, Sherry has made some delicious homemade ham puffs with cheese and apple cinnamon bread for us to share together. And during fellowship, we will take a time to bless the prayer shawl for Jim's <coughs> daughter so that way she knows that she is loved and she is not alone during this time. I'd like to ask everyone to please rise for the benediction. And Darlene, if you could please come forward and join me. <coughs> for those who've been coming for years, you know that Darlene has been a long-term faithful member. For those who've been coming for just a few months, you have not seen her because she has been so busy preparing for the next stage of her life. We'd like to ask if you can assist in the benediction by lifting up your arms. And we'd like to ask everyone to lift your arms up as well. Gracious and Holy One, we give thanks for the gifts of your love. And we know that though we may go our separate ways and we may begin new chapters in our lives, we are united by that love. And with that knowledge, may we take that love and may we all find our own way to do what is just, to do what is kind, and to continue to walk humbly with our Lord and Creator. And may everyone say, Amen. Amen.